because we are going to be talking about one of the most commonly asked questions I know both of us get, which are pet vaccines. This will be a complete deep dive on what we personally follow for vaccines for our pets, as well as titer tests with the legendary uh, Dr. Judy Morgan, who is a world recognized author, speaker, veterinarian, of course, with over 30 years of experience. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're going to jump into it. I'm going to start off with a few hot topic questions. You'll answer those briefly. And then from there, we'll go in the deep dive um, into vaccine protocols, current worries, titer tests, etc. So firstly, in your experience, Dr. Judy, do you believe that most pets are over vaccinated? Probably, well, for those who see veterinarians, because there's a lot of pets who never walk into a veterinary office and Good point. don't get vaccines. Although there are some that never walk into a veterinary office, but they do walk into a big box store and stand in line and get poked with a lot of vaccines. Mm -hmm. So I would say for those who are being vaccinated, probably 95% of them are over vaccinated. Mm -hmm. If a dog is vaccinated, against a disease, are they considered 100% protected against that disease? No. No, and a vaccine is not an immediate, like you poke it in, it's like, poof, he's protected from rabies. Uh, the vaccine actually has to undergo a lot of changes in the body, and the body has to work very hard to do that. And not all bodies are capable of doing that. Right. And do you ever, for your personal pets, do you ever give non-core vaccines, example, Bordetella, Lyme, et cetera. Nope. <laughs> Some of them have come with them on board, which I don't like. Yeah. Uh, when you adopt through shelters and some rescue agencies, they will poke them with everything they've got. Um, yep. So I, unfortunately, I have had many who have come to me over vaccinated, but once they're with me, no. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that sentiment. And now that we have, for those of you watching, now that we have your attention, um, we're going to jump more into kind of a basic foundation all the way up to a deep dive again into vaccines. And I want to give a disclaimer like I do in all my content. Um, first off, there is a free download. It's linked in the description for you on Instagram. It's linked in my bio uh, where Dr. Judy and I, Dr. Judy and team and I work together on creating kind of a vaccine guide that you can share with your veterinarian. And this is again, completely free for you. Um, also, I want <laughs> you to can share, they might not like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I tried to be very kind in some of the wording that we put in there, you know, so that we're not trying to contradict too much, but um, it is a printout, right, that you can take. And Big disclaimer, though, that this content and that guide is not intended to treat, diagnose, recommend, prescribe anything. So you need to work with your local veterinarian. But the cool thing, the cool thing is in the free guide, we give resources on where to find more holistic or integrative veterinarians near you. Or, of course, uh, Dr. Judy's newest book. I just got to give this plug and here's an image of it which will be linked in my bio and in the description. Yep. And she has it right there. Um, just launched and has a deep Instagram. dive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. For Instagram. Um, we'll have a deep dive on uh, her thoughts additionally on vaccines, but as well as just how to help to have a healthier um, pet. So with that, Dr. Judy, I'm so honored to have you here because you have unique experience in that you have practiced um, vet med in both conventional and more integrative and holistic approaches, which gives you this full scope of practice overview. Um, so you've kind of seen it on both ends. And I think that's really valuable for pet parents. So my first question for you is, why should we as pet owners and pet guardians, why should we be concerned about potentially over vaccinating our pets? So many things can go wrong. And I'm going to give you two personal experiences uh, one is from, I was only in practice for maybe three years. Uh, no, more closer to five years. Um, my Doberman suddenly went blind overnight and I took him to a neurologist and the neurologist diagnosed him with granulomatous meningoencephalitis. So that required a spinal tap and you know, all kinds of testing. Um, and it, he said to me, this was in 1989. So I was not holistic yet. I didn't know anything about anything other than traditional. And he said to me, it's probably from the distemper vaccine that your dog was given. 
And this is a young dog. I just about flipped my lid and the dog ended up spending an entire year on steroids. My sister, who is fairly holistic, lives in Massachusetts and she got a new puppy about a little over a year ago. And it's a corgi. And the puppy, she vaccinated a lot more than I ever would have. She's scared of Lyme disease because she lives in Massachusetts, high tick area in New England. So she vaccinated for that. She does a lot of dog shows, a lot of agility work, a lot of competition with her dogs. So they're exposed to a lot of dogs. So she said, well, you know, I, I, I want to got talked into um, giving a whole set of puppy vaccines, many more than I would have given a whole lot of non-core vaccines that I would not have given. And she kept asking me. And the one thing I will give her credit for is she kept spacing them out and she wouldn't let the veterinarian do more than one at a time. But the dog hit about eight months old. It's got meningoencephalitis, incredibly painful, can't move. It's been, this is a young dog. It's been on steroids now for six or seven months, and that's not even working. They're now adding another immunosuppressant in. So what's the life expectancy for a dog who starts on immunosuppressants at eight months old? Um, and they're, they're calling it unknown cause because it's very difficult to trace and absolutely say, but we are seeing more and more of these autoimmune unknown cause encephalitis. So he's been tested for bacterial problems, viral problems, infectious problems. There are none. So what set his immune system into hyperdrive? Mm. You tell me. So, I mean, that's just in, in my tiny little world, two dogs. Um, and I see it in practice all the time. So we see allergies, we see autoimmune disease, we see um, masticatory uh, myositis, which is the shrinking of the head muscles. We see, um, oh my gosh, all kinds of uh, endocrine disease and, and tons of inflammation. So there's just so much that can go wrong when we are overstimulating that immune system. Yeah. And I think... Um, Another, you know, concern of mine, and this is probably getting a little farther down, but when we think about, when I, when I think about vaccinating my pets, my goal is to pr protect them the best that I can and help them build or have immunity against disease versus when we continually just revaccinate or give these boosters every, uh, every year, it's really not giving much additional benefit if my dogs are already protected. So that's for me, it's just kind of over and excessive. And that's kind of a concern that I have. So, um, but going back to the basics, so we talked about some potential side effects, let's actually go even more basic than that. And let's talk about what are the basic core uh, sometimes we're referred to as DAP vaccines versus the non-core. Can we talk through a little bit about what these are and what we could be expected to be recommended by our veterinarians? So core vaccines are the things that are most likely to kill our dogs um, and the things that we see the most or used to see the most. Uh, so that includes rabies. And rabies is really included as a core vaccine because there's zero treatment for it and it is zoonotic, which means people can get it if they get bitten by rabid animals. So, mm -hmm. um, and there are in countries, we, we, we're a little bit spoiled in the US because we don't have much rabies. There's a few cases a year, but, and it's, it's once in a while, it's from a cat or dog exposure, but usually it's uh, wildlife or bats. In other countries where they don't vaccinate for rabies, thousands of people die from rabies every year. Um, from dog bites, from cat bites, from wildlife, from bats. So it, it's definitely, it's not treatable. There's only been a few cases where people survived uh, having a rabies diagnosis. So I can understand why they mandate it. However, they mandate it too often as part of the problem. The other core vaccines are distemper and parvo. The veterinarians throw adenovirus in there, which is a hepatitis. It is rarely seen, rarely seen. And one adenovirus vaccine is good for lifetime, uh, but it's always included in the core vaccine. So when you go in for that distemper or parvo vaccine, it's almost always at least a DAP, a distemper adenovirus parvovirus. Um, and it's hard to even find veterinarians who have something that narrow. A lot of times what they do is they combine five or six things in one syringe. So you're like, oh, you only got one shot. Well, that one shot might have included nine or 10 different diseases. So 
you have to really pay attention to how many letters are in what they list. Is it a DHLPP? By the way, L is four. It's not one L. There's four, even though they list it as one. Um, so there's a lot more in there than what you realize. And they can include uh, Lyme disease in some of those you know, single shots. Um, for the cats, they lump a lot of things in one injection. So um, you have to be a little bit careful about what's being put in there. But the core vaccines are the ones that they recommend for every dog, no matter their lifestyle. So that's distemper, adenovirus, parvo, and rabies. Okay. And we will talk in just a moment about what we personally do for our pets in terms of when we give them how often for puppies and adults. But before we do that, um, let's talk a little bit more about these non-core vaccines, what they are, and their potential, the potential problems with just automatically giving these. So non-core vaccines would be thing like, things like kennel cough, or they call it Bordetella. Kennel cough, uh, the vaccine will have anywhere from two to four different diseases in th the vaccine, and the vaccine can be given up the nose, in the mouth, or injected. Absolutely don't recommend the injectable one. It's pretty useless. Um, so that's usually recommended for dogs that go to boarding, grooming, daycare, dog parks, that's anywhere where they're going to have a lot of dogs together. Um, but unfortunately, half the time you're not asked, what is your dog's lifestyle? It's just like, okay, he's due for his kennel cough vaccine. Well, I talked to somebody yesterday and they're like, yeah, that dog does not go to boarding, grooming, daycare, but we've had kennel cough every six months. And I'm like, why? Um, so there's influenza, same thing. That's There's two flu viruses in one in the vaccine, sort of like um, there are multiple strains of flu vaccine for people. And every year they try to pick the one that they think is going to be the, you know, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. But we pretty much have two influenzas in dogs that are significant, but they're significant in very tiny pockets. Um, so we'll see an outbreak where a whole kennel will get infected. There was um, a dog show in Georgia a few years back where the uh, judge, instead of having the owners open the mouth to show the bite, the judge opened every single mouth on every single dog. And one of the dogs happened to be carrying the virus and a lot of dogs got sick and a few dogs died. And then of course those dogs left the show in Georgia and went all over the place and took it to all the other shows. And so there were some dogs uh, that died. The chances of dying are slim, but much more than kennel cough. Um, and then we have uh, leptospirosis, which is a spirochete. So it's sort of like a bacteria. It's spread through the urine of rats, raccoons, skunks, foxes, and dairy cattle. Uh, if you live in the city, that's actually where we see the most lepto from rats, particularly after, uh, after COVID and everything was locked down, the rat populations got really out of control. So we had some lepto outbreaks. I recommend if you live in the city and you walk your dog on the streets that you put boots on your dog. There's some really nice ones called walkie paws. I'll, I'm going to give her a shout out because I like the product um, that they're, they're like little leggings with rubber booties for your dogs are easy to put on. Um, I mean, I think about that and I'm like, I don't want what's on the bottom of my dog's feet walking around the city in my bed. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm a fan of booties. I, I wouldn't either. Yeah. Even in my neighborhood, I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but like hunting dogs, uh, dogs who are out in the woods a lot, dogs, if they live near waterways where the um, wildlife is going to be, if they're standing water. Um, I only saw about five cases of lepto in my 36 years of clinical practice. Um, so again, we'll see little pockets of it. Um, but what happens is one or two cases will show up somewhere. And I remember um, like 2021, it, I was still in New Jersey and there was this huge, you know, it's on every news station, huge lepto outbreak in a city in northern New Jersey. The huge outbreak resulted in tens of thousands of dogs all over the state and the surrounding states getting vaccinated. Even if they were already vaccinated, all the vets were, they were literally doing parking lot drive throughs and poking your dog through the window of the car. You didn't even have to get an exam. Give them 10 bucks, get vaccinated, drive through. Craziness. The outbreak, four cases. Four cases in one city in northern New Jersey, but it hit the news and all the veterinarians were like, like there was a neighboring clinic to us. They did the drive through thing for a parvo outbreak of two cases. 
uh, they got on the Philadelphia News. We were in southern New Jersey. They got on the Philadelphia News. They had 2,000 people drive through their parking lot in three hours to get their dogs vaccinated through the window for Parvo. Crazy. So that is a veterinary practice that is feeding off of people's fear and looking at a quick way to make a buck. Absolutely the wrong way to do things. So anyway, we have lepto. So that is totally a lifestyle vaccine. Um, There are some kennels who will require it. I know in New York City, they are crazy about your dog that has to have 27 vaccines to walk in the door. Um, I would never take my dogs there. Um, So let's see, other lifestyle, Lyme disease, which is Lyme's a tick-borne disease, also a spirochete, very similar to the lepto. So it does respond to antibiotics. Um, People get really scared and you know we play off a of fear factor unfortunately so people get really scared i don't want my dog to get lyme he could die you know it could cause kidney failure this that and the other thing and yes we have seen cases of kidney failure from lyme disease but they're the cases that don't get diagnosed they're the cases where nobody noticed the symptoms nobody you know paid attention to the fact that the dog was covered with ticks or whatever and it, it doesn't take a lot of ticks it, you could just you know, be unlucky enough to have that one. The problem is there's a dozen tick-borne diseases. We have a vaccine for one of them. uh, And so we go crazy vaccinating. It's a horrible vaccine. It's only 60% effective if your dog's ever been exposed to Lyme and 80% uh, effective if your dog has never been exposed to Lyme. So that means if you start them as a puppy before they've been exposed. So I don't like the vaccine. It's reactive. It causes problems. The Lyme vaccine for people was pulled off the market because so many people develop problems from it. Um, there's rattlesnake vaccine again, not very effective, but, uh, it might buy you enough time to get your dog that was bitten to the veterinary clinic to get the antivenom. Um, really rarely recommended. Uh, I'm trying to think there's coronavirus vaccine. Yeah. Never recommend that one. And I see so many puppies. That's one of those. When you go in for your puppy shots, you get the DHLP PCV. Uh, so it's got a million things thrown in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's, generally not a disease that causes death. Uh, The only way a puppy is going to, it's called yellow diarrhea. And the only way a puppy is going to die from coronavirus is if you have really unsanitary conditions, you don't treat them, you don't keep them hydrated um, and you let the vomiting and diarrhea get ahead of you. It's not like parvovirus that actually destroys the immune system and destroys the lining of the gut. So um, very different. And so again, I, I don't recommend it. Yeah. I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting any. Um, I have the AHA, AAHA kind of list up in front of me and I don't, I think you've covered all of them. Yeah, you did. Um, very good job. <laughs> you know your stuff. I think it, with regarding the, the tick-borne illness, my Labrador, I think I mentioned this on a previous live, but it still boggles my mind. He, he had all of the vaccines. This is probably when he was two or three. Um, and he got a tick, tick-borne illness. They still don't know the exact one to this date, but he became <laughs> completely paralyzed um and uh, they had to use a reversal agent he was fine and he's turns 14 this year and he'll be fine but i was like how did this happen he had every single vaccine he was on all the flea and tick preventatives um now we did hike and we were outdoorsy but beyond that we did everything we thought was right and he still got very very ill and they said he would have passed had i not rushed him to the vet and they had to you know all the vets there's four vets in the clinic came to help and tried to you know fix what was going on but Um, That was what made my eyes open to not necessarily just relying only on these kind of vaccines or flea and tick preventatives because they aren't 100%. And as you mentioned, the potential side effects are really severe. And it's not just these ones we see all over the news like seizures or, um, you know, rashes or swelling or even passing out or collapsing, although those happen, but it's this long-term effects that you talked about, like immunity impact or these allergies that um, dogs get. And these there's these Facebook groups that I'm in where these people come in and say, my dog was perfectly healthy. And then they get all these rounds of vaccines. And all of a sudden they have all these immune issue, issue um, mm. issues or conditions or autoimmune diseases or chronic skin conditions the rest of their life. And that's yep. really concerning to me. So that's why I'm really particular about how um, I vaccinate my dogs. Personally, I know you are as well. Um, So I guess let's talk a little bit about what your general, I don't want to use the word recommendation. So what you generally would do for your pets, starting if you got a brand new puppy, um, what you would do in terms of the core versus non-core, 
and then kind of what you would do um, if you adopted an adult dog and you don't know their history and what you would do. So this is, and I, I hate to even say this because um, I, mine's a bit of a special case, but I have an 18 month old, no, 19 month old puppy. Um, and I got him when he was 14 weeks old, the breeder flew him out from Chicago uh, and he was born with hydrocephalus. So water on the brain. So, and he's got a lot of issues from a Chinese medicine standpoint, he's Jing deficient, which means he didn't get the life essence that he was supposed to. And mm. his parts and pieces are not put together. Right. So his hind legs, the joints bend the wrong way. <laughs> and he's got hydrocephalus. He's got really bad teeth, even though he's a young dog. And all of that goes with the water element in Chinese medicine. So it's another whole thing, but I know exactly why he has all these issues. So there you go. <laughs> Your other book so, on that will be linked below as well. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, you know, vaccinating him is really scary for me. Using any kind of chemicals is really scary because I don't know how his little brain is going to react. I don't know how his little body is going to react. So this breeder is a holistic breeder and she's very good, very up to date on things. And so she knew that his mother had good immunity. She did blood tests on the mother and made sure that she had good immunity for the core problems like distemper and adenovirus and parvovirus. So we knew that through the mother's milk, little Forrest Gump got the antibodies from mama. Now, if you vaccinate a puppy too early, like I have a good client who is getting a new puppy this week. She's waited six months for this puppy. And before she could get the breeder, uh, get to the breeder to tell her no, the breeder gave vaccines at six weeks of age. Well, the antibodies from the mother go through the milk to the baby and it's absorbed through the intestines. And when you give a vaccine, when the maternal immunity is still circulating in the puppy's bloodstream, the vaccine is not effective. It's like null and void. So it just cancels it out. Unfortunately, it also makes them less able to have a really good immune response later on when you give the vaccine at the right time. Um, so I've been emailing back and forth with her about how we're going to solve this issue with this puppy that was vaccinated too early. And if you buy puppies in pet stores, which I do not recommend, uh, do they're going to they're <laughs> gonna start vaccinating them at four weeks old. Uh, they'll do four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks. By the time you get them, they could have had 20 vaccines. I mean, it's crazy. Um, and if you get a puppy at six weeks, which again, I don't recommend, let them stay with mom for 10 weeks. Uh, don't let your vet talk you into they have to have vaccines every two weeks. They don't. And the later you start, the less they have to have. So my little guy, his breeder wanted him to stay with mom a little longer because he's a special needs child. And so she waited till 14 weeks to fly him out to me. And in the couple of weeks before she brought him, she has a really good holistic vet who's willing to bend rules. And so she gave him, so usually the vaccines are one cc. She gave him two tenths of a cc of distemper by itself. Okay. And then a couple of weeks later, she gave him two tenths of a cc of parvo by itself. That's all he's ever had. Now, he lives on my farm in a sheltered environment, exposed to my other healthy dogs, to other healthy dogs here at the office. Uh, he's and, and actually now I take him out to parks because he I, he doesn't play with other dogs that we don't know, but I take him to parks and I take him to places. He's getting some natural exposure, some natural immunity. He's going to have to get some dose of rabies vaccine at some point, but I'm waiting because I know that rabies really can play with the nervous system. And that's my scare with him because of the hydrocephalus. So he's my special case. Now, on the other <laughs> hand, we just adopted a dog who was supposed to be 14. He's not. He's like five. Um, he's a lot more energy than I wanted. Um, he came through a shelter. They gave him flea and tick medication, heartworm medication, and every vaccine that I listed 10 minutes ago. Uh, so I know what his vaccine status is. He's had way too many. Yeah. The rest of my dogs, um, most of them at the time I adopted them had had at least the core vaccines. Um, and then, I mean, George is 15 and a half. I got him when he was one and a half. Yeah. I think he, I think he's had one rabies since in that whole period of time. 
possibly two. Um, I used to titer them all the time for the core vaccines, run the blood test to see whether they had protection. I don't care anymore. They're, they're on my farm, in my yard. They're not exposed to shelter dogs. They're not exposed to sick dogs. They're not going to a veterinary clinic with me where there are sick dogs. Um, and frankly, if they were going and being exposed, it'd be like, great, we're going to build your immunity. We're going we're to make natural immunity to natural exposure. So um, you just have to be careful when you do that. Uh, there are people that follow me that are very holistic and don't give any vaccines. I, uh, somebody posted that their dog had like the highest titer I had ever seen for Parvo and has never had a vaccine. Yep. So and that's because they can exposure. get it right. Natural exposure or can they get the antibodies from their mother? If their mother they do, was but the, mo the maternal antibody does wear off. It okay. wears off usually between 14 and 18 weeks of age, which okay. is why, you know, we don't know when it's going to wear off. So it might be nine weeks, might be 18 weeks, could be anywhere in between. So that's why veterinarians start vaccinating. They usually start recommending at eight weeks and they're vaccinating them every two to four weeks because they're like, well, we don't know when this one's going to come down and we want this one to be coming up. And so you want to, you know, catch them when they're going to cross and so that you don't dip too low. Um, but I, I, I see after, after this many years of practice, I see so many fallacies with that. It's such a wrong way to do it. Yeah. So when we're thinking about, if we're going to kind of summarize um, a vaccine schedule. Again, not a recommendation, just kind of what we follow for our personal pets. This will all be written out for those of you on Instagram, linked in the bio. And for those of you anywhere else will be in the description. But kind of how we've come together to summarize it. Um, to where you can print it out and share it with your vet, is that if maternal immunity is unknown and the puppy is in a potentially high-risk environment, that initial core DAP vaccine, which would just be distemper, adenovirus, and parvovirus, would be between about nine to 10 weeks old. But as you mentioned just now, that if the puppies were kept in a safe environment, had good maternal protection, um, uh, our preference would be to wait for those initial core uh, DAP vaccines um, to do parvovirus at about 16 to 18 weeks, and then two weeks later do adenovirus and parvovirus. Does that sound like a good? Yeah. So, and you can do it, that. You can do it either way around. Uh, you can do the distemper first, and then come back two to three weeks later and do the parvo. The biggest problem that we have with that right now is there is no plain distemper vaccine available on the market. The only canine distemper vaccine that is available is labeled for ferrets, but it is canine distemper. It's just labeled for ferrets. So uh, for our clients, uh, when I was in practice, we had plain distemper for a long time and then they took it off the market because not enough veterinarians were using it. Why would they? Um, you can get plain parvo vaccine. Okay. So we would do the plain distemper. And I actually started using off-label the ferret vaccine because it's a canine distemper vaccine. Right. So we would use that. And then I would usually do that around 14 weeks. And then around 16 to 17, I would do the straight parvo and then come back at 20 weeks and do the blood test, do the titer. Right. And uh, depending on whether they got kind of screwed up with early vaccines, uh, for those who waited and those were the only vaccines they ever got, they had the strongest titers. Right. And uh, Ron Schultz and some of the other immunologists have done some really good studies on these. Like there's tons of studies out there that show the longer you wait and the less you give, the better response you get. So if we keep poking at them and we start too early where we've got that maternal interference um, and then we're poking them every two weeks, the immune system actually does not respond as well because it's kind of been a little bit of immune confusion. And it's yeah. like, I don't even know where to go with this. Um, and then rabies vaccine is uh, labeled to be used as early as 12 weeks of age. Um, in my practice and for my own dogs, like I said, Forrest is 18 months, <clears throat> hasn't gotten his yet. Um, for my own dogs like, and for my patients, depending on the size of the dog, I would usually do between six and 12 months. The smaller the dog, the longer I wait. Yep. We want to give them a chance to mature. Big dogs are going to handle vaccinations so much better than small dogs. Small dogs like to have vaccine reactions. They like to drop dead. They like to have vomiting and diarrhea. They like to be painful, swell up, have trouble breathing. Like, 
small dogs and vaccines are very risky. Dachshunds, oh my gosh, dachshunds want to react to everything. Is that because the dose is so, the dose is the same regardless of the size of dog? No, I think that they're just really a lot more sensitive. Sensitive to it? Okay. You know, the, the dose may be part of it. We don't really know because nobody's done that, those studies. Um, but they're, they just are more sensitive to things. Mm. Um, they're more likely to have allergic reactions to just about anything really. Um, and so f the smaller your dog is, the more critical it is to limit the number of vaccines and to spread them out. When I get records of a five pound dog that went in and was given 14 vaccines at the same time, I want to rip every hair out of my head because they are lucky the dog is alive. Another thing I want to point out, if your dog has a vaccine reaction, Mm -hmm. Your dog shouldn't get that vaccine anymore. And that's one of the reasons why you want to spread them out and give one at a time, because if they have a reaction, you want to know which one it reacted to, yeah. because if they reacted, you don't want to give that one again. Now, traditional veterinarians are going to say, oh, no problem. We'll give them a dose of Benadryl. We'll inject them with Benadryl before we give the vaccine so that he doesn't have a reaction. Mm -hmm. Well, you're one Benadryl shot away from a deadly reaction. I don't think that's enough protection. And I've actually had dogs die from Benadryl because it caused heart problems for them. So it's, it's a very tricky thing. So for me, and I, I have this mindset with all medications, if you have a reaction or your pet has a reaction to a medication, do not use another medication to cover up the symptoms. Yeah. You want to know what's going on. The body is reacting for a reason. The body's saying, I cannot tolerate that. Do not put that in here because I'm going to try to die. Yeah. Don't cover it up with something else. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I, I, I agree with the same thing that it's like people, you know, it's like when we think of the concept of pain, that we think it's a negative thing, but it's really a way to communicate to us or if our animals in pain that something's wrong. So we need to change, shift, pivot. So, um, okay. So to summarize, we think about, again, for our personal pets, if we had a brand new to us puppy, we do the initial DAP core vaccines at around nine to 10 weeks, um, a little bit older if we, they, we knew they had the maternal uh, protection. The second round of vaccines would be around 14 to 16 weeks if we did the initial ones around nine to 10. And then about um, two to four weeks after the second round is when we typically would do our initial titers, which we'll talk about in a second. And then as you said, um, rabies uh, between six to 12 months now, or is required by law, then what about after that? What is your recommendation? Okay, I've done um, my dogs a year. Um, they've done all the initial vaccines. They've done their rabies. Do I just automatically revaccinate every year like my vet is telling me to? Um, or and let me rephrase that. Would you automatically revaccinate or give a booster to your dog automatically every year, year after year? Absolutely not. And I didn't for my clients. Um, so the, if generally they're going to finish their puppy vaccines at about four months of age. Mm -hmm. So one year later, when they're 16 months old, that's when you're going to get that card in the mail that says, hey, he's due for all this stuff again. And that's when you get to say, I'd like a titer, please. I'd like to see what he needs and whether he needs it. Um, and if it comes back as being protected, there's no need to give them another vaccine. Yeah. Now, it it is up to the pet owner to decide how often they need to do that titer. Most of our clients were doing it once a year because they needed proof for boarding, grooming, daycare. Mm -hmm. If you don't need proof for, this is why I quit doing my guys. I don't need proof for anything. I, I know where they are and what their exposure is. Uh, but if you need proof, for instance, some veterinarians will not let, see your pet if it's not up to date on vaccinations, particularly rabies, which makes me really crazy. Yeah. Um, they're willing to see your pet to come in to get the rabies so that they can be seen. Uh, <laughs> a little yep. bit nuts. I know. Uh, so somebody said, you know, what do I tell my veterinarian who yeah. sends me this card and is saying to me every year, you're overdue for your yearly vaccines, including rabies, canine distemper combo, Bordetella Lyme. That's when you get to say to them, Let's talk about my dog's lifestyle. My dog does not go to boarding, grooming, daycare. I really don't need kennel cough for my dog. I've never pulled a tick off my dog. 
I talked to somebody yesterday. They've had Lyme vaccine every year, and the dog has been oral on oral flea and tick preventative its entire life. They've never found a tick on their dog. Those oral preventatives do not repel ticks. Right. They just don't walk their dog where there's ticks, yet this dog is getting vaccinated every year. Have a conversation about lifestyle. Hey, my dog walks on the street in my neighborhood. We don't have wildlife. We don't have rats. We don't have standing water. The chances of my dog getting lepto are nil. So you can just take that one off the list. I've never pulled a tick. Not going to get Lyme. Take that one off the list. Rabies? Well, let's see. Has it been three years? Because if it hasn't been, except for the first, the first one is a one year. After right. that, they're a three-year vaccine. Do not let your vet talk you into, you have to give rabies every year. No, you don't. It's a three-year vaccine. So, you know, don't fall for that. Distemper and parvo, we know, and it even says it on, and here's something that these clients can use when you're going into your talk to your veterinarian, on AVMA, which is the American Veterinary Medical Association, mm -hmm. and AHA, the American Animal Hospital Association, if you go to those websites and you put in the search bar vaccines, it will state on there that the core vaccines, distemper, hepatitis, and parvo, should be given no more often than every three to five years. It's really more like five to seven. It says it right on our parent organization. So yeah. veterinarians who are insisting on yearly vaccines for the core vaccines that we know last so much longer, they're not even following the rules of their own association. Yep. So that is something you can print out and take and say, look right here, look. Yeah. And we actually, we actually linked that. So on the, uh, start the guide, the vaccine guide that we wrote, we linked that on there. So under the resource section, you guys can take that, print it out, click on the link. And we also put, cause there's, you mentioned science before and, and Schultz, Dr. Schultz, immunologist, all of that is linked there for you as well. So that you can take all of these resources and show your veterinarian, because I think a lot of it, I don't think that there's mal intention, right? I think it's, they just don't know. And there's not a lot of, and I think there's a lot of fear out there too. And there's probably, this might be conspiracy side of me, a little bit of money behind, right? This kind of marketing behind, oh, like we need to get vaccines every single year. I mean, think about that. If every single, how many pets are, I don't even know. Millions well, and millions part of, of it, part of it is not that, not even that they want to vaccinate every year. They want to get you in the in office the every year for an exam. And I'm, and yes, your Which pet you should, should be, be yes. going in every year for an exam. Absolutely, one hundred percent, they should be going in for an exam. Um, and while they're there, gee, have lumps and bumps checked and, and have their abdomen palpated and have their heart listened Mental. to. <laughs> yeah, get their teeth looked at. So, you know, and when your veterinarian makes recommendations for lab work, that is preventative medicine. That is for the health of your pet. I would much rather go in and spend $300 getting complete lab work done than spend $300 getting a bunch of needles poked into my dog that he doesn't need. Yeah. So, so we talked about core vaccines. We talked about non-core vaccines with the non-core vaccines. It's really lifestyle dependent, but even still, like, for example, I don't do, yeah, we don't do any of the non-core, but I still, I don't go to, I don't go to dog parks when they're populated, but when they're empty, we have one near us, for example, that's empty in the morning. I'll take my dogs there and have had no issues. So again, that's more lifestyle. But then after all the initial rounds of vaccines and the rabies required by law, we can do titer tests, which we've mentioned, but we have not defined, Dr. Judy, what a titer test is. So can you, if I've never heard of a titer test before, um, can you explain to me what it is? Yeah, it's actually really simple. It's mm -hmm. so think of your immune system as puzzle pieces that go together. So the foreign invader the parvovirus, the, so we've all seen pictures of coronavirus, right? It's like this round thing with all these little, it's a ball with spikes all over it. Well, when the body is exposed to that puzzle piece, the immune system says, I have things that can fight that off. I'm going to make the interlocking puzzle piece. And then it locks together and neutralizes it. So that's how a vaccine works. When we give like a parvo vaccine, we're usually, we, we either use a killed vaccine, so it's a killed virus, or a modified live vaccine, which is uh, we took that 
viral particle or whatever we're vaccinating for and we modified it so let's say we cut a couple chunks off it but it's still got just enough of the puzzle piece left that the body goes oh i can make something against that so we can actually do a blood test and measure the level of the antibodies so when we're doing parvo we're measuring how many of these parvo antibodies are available to attack these guys if my dog should be exposed yep. and so each lab has their own numbers. Some labs will just give you positive or negative. Other labs will say, you know, anything greater than one to four is fine. Anything greater than one to 80 is fine. Um, so if your pet comes back that they have enough circulating antibodies, you don't need to poke them again. You don't need to make them make more. It's, it's sort of like you can't be a little bit pregnant. You either are or you aren't. You can't get more pregnant. So <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that may be a bad are. analogy, but it's sort of like you, you already got that. So we don't need more of that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a simple science. They literally take a blood test, spin mm -hmm. it down, send the liquid from, they take the cells off and send the liquid out to a lab for testing. There actually are even um, titer tests that can be run in the veterinary hospital. There's one called uh, AccuCheck, I think, or mm -hmm. AccuVet. Uh, and so they can actually run it right there. So some vet clinics, if they're doing enough of them, they'll do that. We always sent ours out to the lab. Now, part of the problem is depending on which lab they are sending it to, it can cost you an arm and a leg. Some of the labs charge them a fortune. And on, on the most part, whatever the lab is charging the veterinarian, they're doubling that fee to you. That's how they make their money. And that's to pay for the doctor's interpretation of it and speaking to you and spending their time. And, you know, so that's fine. But if we have a lab that's charging $40 to do a titer versus a lab that's charging $200 to do a titer, your titers can be $80 or they can be $400. Yeah. Um, so if you, if your veterinarians and a lot of veterinarians will quote a really high price because they don't want to do it. It's yeah. so much faster and easier for them to poke a vaccine and run than it is to spend the time to get a blood sample, depending on, you know, how cooperative your pet is, um, you know, and spinning it and sending it out and having to interpret it. And some of them don't feel comfortable interpreting them, which is kind of silly because the lab tells you it's either good or it's not. Yeah. Um, so that's a little silly, but, uh, so, and definitely ask, like, if you go in and you say, I'd like to have titers run for distemper and parvo, don't ask for non-core vaccine titers. There are none that they're, they're not, they're useless. Uh, so it's really for the core vaccines, distemper, right. parvo and, uh, rabies. rabies. And I don't even ask for, I, we didn't even run adenovirus because if they've ever had an adenovirus and we just don't see it. So mm -hmm. I didn't even care about that one. Um, so, you know, if, so the first thing is, if you're asking for a titer, ask the price so that you can say yes or no before you get to the front desk. Because when you get to the front desk and you see a line item for $400 and you go, Ugh, and then you're too embarrassed to go back and say, I can't do that. And then, you know, you go home and go, oh my God, I can't pay my rent this month because I just spent $400 on a titer and I didn't ask. So always ask, get an estimate, make you know, find out, are they in that $90 category or are they in that $400 category? Because it yeah. makes a big difference. If their pricing is crazy high, there are places that, and I think they're in the, um, they're in the download. Guide, yeah. um, so there are places where the blood can be sent, where it will be a lot less expensive. However, you are going to have to get the blood draw. So while you're there, say, well, how much would you charge me? Like, I don't want to pay $600 for that titer. How much would you charge me to take a blood sample, spin it down and hand it to me? I'll send it in myself. Um, and that's fine. They, I mean, they, they can charge a reasonable fee. That's, I, you have to pay them for their time and their expertise and their equipment and their staff that is going to have to do that for you. Fine. Pay that fee and then send it somewhere. Or give them the resource and say, would you send it here for me? Because it's going to cost less. Yeah. I think, and, and that is all linked in the guide where there's one, a printout that you can show your vet that actually talks to them about how, I think it's from Protect the Pets, um, that will talk about how they can start doing in-house more affordable titer testing. But I think to summarize, the good news is because titer testing is becoming more mainstream, it's there's more and more affordable options out there. Because I know that was big, just uh, two years ago, I remember talking about titer testing and 
that being the number one objection is like, I can't, I can't afford that because it would be three, four, four, five hundred dollars to do that. So, and that's reasonable. Um, I think the most powerful thing I learned about titer tests was that when we're vaccinating, and we talked about this earlier, but when we're vaccinating our dogs, we kind of think we're giving them immunization, like, but the vaccine vaccination does not equal immunization. And so what's happening is we kind of have two options. We can, well, we have three, one, we can do nothing, um, in terms of revaccinating Two, we can just revaccinate and give boosters every single year and hope it works and hope that our dog doesn't have any reactions or three, which you just talked about titer tests, which can actually help identify if they have immunity towards that disease. And as you said before, I think this is so key that you could give the core vaccine uh, one, maybe twice after the second round, and they could have immunity and antibodies the rest of their life, or at least for several, several years. And I think it's really powerful that instead of just automatically revaccinating every year, we can just titer test. Yeah. And I do want to say that I put this in the guide, according to AHA, this is a direct quote, which is American Animal Hospital Association, um, says, direct quote, measuring antibody levels provides a reasonable assessment of protective immunity. And this is something you can show to your veter your conventional veterinarian if they're like on the fence, like, oh, well, antibodies aren't conclusive, et cetera. Nothing is 100%, in my opinion, right? Like there's always risks right. for everything, so but- Somebody asked you a good question. They said, if a titer is low and says that the pet requires a vaccine, mm -hmm. do you have to give a secondary shot to be immune? So here's a really interesting thing. If your dog is over six months old and you need to give a booster of anything, or let's say you adopt a dog and you don't know the immune status and you can't get a titer, don't want to spend money on a titer, they only need one shot. One will do it. Their immune system is mature. They need one. So let's say the parvo titer came back low mm -hmm. and your vet says, well, they have to get a parvo vaccine. They only need one. You do not have to do one and then repeat it three to four weeks later. Just one. Um, if you, uh, if your pet has lapsed, so we see this a lot, like you, you got your series of two leptos or you got your series of two Lyme vaccines and now it's been like three or four years and for whatever reason you decide our lifestyle's changed. I want to get a lepto and a Lyme booster for my dog. First of all, separate them. Don't do them at the same time, but you only need one. You don't have to redo the two series again. Part of the reason for that is the body has immune memory. Um, and this is something that we can't measure, unfortunately, the, the immune memory. So we can measure antibodies. That's the circulating antibodies. What we can't measure is what lies within the cells. And so let's say your dog has a low parvo titer and then he gets exposed to parvo and you haven't done anything. He may, because he at one point knew what parvo was, his body may wake up and release from those cells enough antibodies to take care of the problem. And things like parvo are really... It's really a disease of puppies and really extremely immune compromised animals. Once they're adults, most of them just develop enough natural immunity and ability to fight it off. Um, before we, so Parvo really came to the forefront in the uh, early 1980s, and I graduated from veterinary school in 1984. So my junior and senior year of veterinary school, we had wards full of Parvo dogs, wards, and it was all puppies wards full of puppies. Um, and that's what we see. And so before the parvo vaccine was available and before we were uh, routinely vaccinating for parvo, it was a lot more rampant. And there are certain breeds that are much more prone to parvo and may need a later vaccine like at 20 weeks. And those are the Dobermans, the Rottweilers, pit bulls. We don't know why, but they just seem to be much more susceptible. And we opened a new clinic in a um, fairly um, economically challenged town in southern New Jersey, and a lot of the animals weren't getting any veterinary care at all, so mm -hmm. parvo vaccine was not being given. And uh, during the summer months, because that's when these viruses are more rampant, um, we would see at least one litter of puppies, usually Rottweilers, every week with parvo.
Hmm. And so it used to be a huge problem. And once we got into that community and, uh, you know, really raised the level of care, the level of nutrition, how the, you know, really educating the clients, we saw very little, very little. Um, and really, it was a matter of even just getting the mama dog to have good immunity so that she passed something on to the puppies. Yeah. And that's, you know, this entire conversation, I, I, I love learning from you and talking with you about this because you're not so extreme on either end that you're like, oh, we can never give any vaccine ever, right? Like you acknowledge and you educate that there are risks. Like people, dogs can get ill from these things, but it's my understanding of how your approach is, is really setting our dogs up for success and only giving them that which they need, not more. Um, and on that note, do you have any recommendations of what you would do for your dogs either before or after giving vaccines? Like maybe I had somebody in here said, I just got all my dog, all their vaccines, like kind of freaking out. They're not having symptoms, which by the way, I know in your book, you say that if your dog has symptoms, you need to report that. But, um, but they're not having symptoms, but they want to set their dog's immunity up for success either before or after. Are there any general things that you do for your animals? Yeah. So, do? um, there are homeopathic remedies that are recommended at the time of vaccination. So Listen is the homeopathic used for rabies vaccine, and the rest of them we use Thuja, T-H-U-J-A. Mm -hmm. um, we have products on our website. There are products uh, that are specifically made, you know, sort of as an anti-vaccinosis or, you know, to rebalance the system. Um, and so in my clinic, we had Listen. Uh, homeopathic remedies in the hospital. So when the day that they would come in for a rabies vaccine, we would also give them the homeopathic remedy at the same time. Um, if they do have reactions, um, then you are going to need something more long-term. So you know, things to help drain the liver because the liver is a big part of the detoxifying system. So we'll mm -hmm. do milk thistle, that sort of thing. Um, and then just strengthening and evening out the immune system. So using adaptogens, mushrooms are great adaptogens. So they can either make the immune system function better or they can tone it down if it's kind of gotten out of control. We can use things like colostrum. So there are a lot of things that we can do to try to even out the problem if they have a reaction. And um, if your pet has a reaction, even if it's just they were stiff or sore or tender in the area, you absolutely need to tell your veterinarian. And then you also need to say to your veterinarian, I would like this reported to the FDA's adverse event reaction page. Because only 1% of adverse events get reported. So we went through a period of time Oh my gosh, maybe 15 years ago, uh, we were having a lot of dogs react to the rabies vaccine. Like we would give them the rabies vaccine and before they'd even hit the front door, they were vomiting, having diarrhea, swelling up. And I had one client with three dachshunds, all three of her dachshunds blew up, which is why it's dachshunds. And they had never done that before. Um, and we had a whole bunch of them. So I reported every one of them. And it ended up, we had a bad batch of vaccine. But if I hadn't, it, it, you know, if I hadn't seen that many animals have a problem and if I hadn't reported it, it nobody else would have known. So yeah. it's really critical that if they have a reaction, one, you want it in their record, you want it known that, mm, you know, we got to be really careful. We don't want to give a bunch of vaccines at once. I don't, he had 10 that day. I don't even know which one he reacted to. Right. So we got we to gotta split them up. If I absolutely have to give a vaccine, we got to split them up. I got to figure out where the problem is. I mean, personally, I just wouldn't vaccinate anymore. But um, so it's really important that that is noted in your pet's medical record and that it's also reported to the FDA. What if a, somebody asks this, what if a veterinarian uh, only offers combo vaccines? Like they, they can't split them up at all. Do we have any options? Call around. Animals? Call around. Okay. <laughs> Call around. I mean, yeah. in a lot of, in a lot of States, you can buy your own vaccines. Um, the, it, and really interestingly in New Jersey, you can go to places like tractor supply, you can buy the vaccines, but you can't buy the needle and syringe to give it. Interesting. I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. And, so yeah. clients would come in. Unfortunately, a lot of the ones that are sold there are the really big combo vaccines. Like here, you can get 20 in one. Um, yeah. But when clients would come in to me and bring those vaccines, 
I would look at how it was brought to me because they need to be refrigerated. So if it was brought to me and taken out of somebody's purse, I'm like, I don't know if I trust that one anymore. Yeah. Um, so, and you can call around, you can request. So for instance, for rabies vaccine, we recommend only a thimerosal free vaccine. They're less likely to react, less likely to make tumors from it. Um, and a lot of veterinarians have never heard of a tea free or thimerosal free vaccine. So we've educated a lot of veterinarians by having clients go in and say, Hey, I want that tea free vaccine. They're like, what? And <laughs> yeah. And the veterinarians are like, I've never heard of that. As uh, one client um, said that she kept calling, she moved and she kept calling the clinic and saying, do you have a tea-free vaccine? And everybody was like, I don't know. I don't know. What is that? What is that? Took a little while, but she finally got the doctor on the phone after a couple of weeks and said, I want a tea-free vaccine. And the doctor said, I have no idea. And she went and got the vial out of the refrigerator and said, oh, that is the one we carry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> didn't even know what they were. Didn't, didn't even, even know. know what they were giving. So, so. so they weren't specifically asking for it. They just locked yeah. into it. So. <laughs> and then if you are going to give them uh, separately, if you're able to find that somebody asks, like, how long in between would you spread them out? Two to four weeks? I think is what two you're saying. Weeks, before? Two, two weeks. Two weeks is the minimum. Okay. Uh, if you can go three to four, uh, it just gets. You know, if you have an animal where you're going to have to, you know, for whatever reason, lifestyle reasons, you know, mandatory for things you need to do with them, uh, you could be at your vet's office every month trying to get something, but it's much better to do it that way. Yeah. We used to, we used to make deals with people. We'd say, you can prepay for the, the next vaccine because I don't want to give them together. Prepay for it now. We won't charge you an office visit when you come back the second time. We'll just grab your animal. The technician will give that, that vaccine that we wanted separated out. You'll have to hang around for five minutes to make sure they don't have a reaction, but you're already paid. So, you know, you don't have to stop at the front desk. You don't have to pay for another office visit. Um, and so sometimes you can make deals with your veterinarian. Like, look, I, I really want these spread out and, you know, can I pay you off for them now? And I'll just come in every two weeks and you can pop them with the one that I want. <laughs> yeah. Did, is there a better, somebody, sorry, one more question. Somebody asked, is there a better part of the body? to put the vaccine if oh, as God, you're yes. a veterinarian. Okay. So what is that part? Yeah. Really critical. Do not, do not allow vaccines to be given over the shoulder area or over the loins. You want mm. vaccines given as low as possible on the hind legs. And this is horrible, but that's because if they have a big tumor, you can amputate the leg. Uh, we had one dog that came into the hospice group monkey's house, had a 14 pound tumor on its left loin from a vaccine. And on the right loin, it had about a five pound tumor. We took off the big one because the dog couldn't even lay on that side. There's no way to get the root of those tumors. So it came back slowly over a couple of years. Um, for kitty cats, it's really bad. If they make a tumor, it's gonna be really ugly. So when you have vaccines given over the shoulder area mm -hmm. and they make a big tumor, there's, there's nothing you can do. And that mm -hmm. is, I mean, I, this is where I get a little bit crazed because I'm like, okay, veterinary medicine is all about cutting off body parts in response to something that we did. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying we should never vaccinate. I'm just saying we need to be responsible because when you see an animal with a big, open, horrible tumor, and then you have to take off their leg and then it spreads anyway, that's doesn't make you feel great. Yeah, that's hard. Um, and yet probably another reason why you, the field that you chose is such a difficult, challenging, stressful one, because it's just, it's, it's really hard. You know, I, I have empathy for these conventional veterinarians that the, I think it just comes from, I don't know, we call it, um, I can't think of the word where, uh, you want to do the best, but you just aren't educated on it. And, and I imagine what you learn in vet school is definitely more on the just jab, jab, jab. Um, yeah. and well, when I was in school, titers didn't exist and it was an annual yeah. thing. And, and there's no science behind the annual vaccines. That was somebody just said, Hey, how about we just, you don't send out reminders every year. <laughs> there was no science behind it. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's interesting. And then somebody else was saying like, it's tough because I, I, you know, these people in the comments are saying like, I go to, um, groomers or I go to training classes or, doggy daycare, dog park, et cetera. So I, my dog does have exposure. Um, so, but I don't want to give those, um, those vaccines for whatever reason, what I'll say in my personal experience, because I like to do a lot of those things, not the dog parks, but I love doing training classes. 
um, one of my dogs goes to a groomer and it takes a bit, but I actually would just show them my results from the titer test. And so far I've had no issues for it. In fact, we had to move into an apartment, uh, two years ago and they were like hardcore. You have to have every vaccine under the book. And I just took them my antibody titer test results to be quite frank, I don't think they knew what they were looking at, but it showed, <laughs> like I told my vet, I said, can you put on there that, can you write, like it shows immunization towards whatever. And he did. And, um, they took it like, okay, this works. And we lived there for two years and we've I've used it with groomers. And so, you know, you just have to make a decision that's best for your dog, but also it's kind of on us, unfortunately, as pet owners to advocate for our pets and to help educate others in the community because it does, you know, that's the only way is to get this information out. There are some boarding, grooming, daycare facilities that will not accept titers, which is ridiculous. And many, many won't. Yeah. It's just because they're not educated. And so yeah. when I had my clinics in New Jersey, we spent a lot of time educating owners of boarding, grooming, daycare facilities so that they would understand what it was that they were looking at and, you know, what people were saying. And another thing with uh, boarding, grooming, daycare, sometimes they will allow you to sign a waiver. It says, I'm not going to give my dog kennel cough vaccine. I'm not going to give my dog influenza vaccine. I'll sign a waiver right now. If my dog comes home with kennel cough, no problem, no harm, no foul. I took the responsibility. So that is up to you and you can have that conversation with them. Some of them will bend and some of them will not. Uh, me personally, I would never board my dogs. I would never send my dogs to daycare. Yeah. Uh, I pay farm sitters and house sitters. Uh, my vacations get real expensive by the time I'm taking care of 47 animals, but it is what it is. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, and for my puppies, puppy class, he went to puppy training class without all of his vaccines. He was around a bunch of other puppies actually at the veterinary clinic. Um, because <laughs> the training was held at my veter my veterinarian's yep. clinic, which was great. Yeah. Uh, and they, they know who I am. They know what I do and don't do. And they were fine. And, you know, he was around other puppies who were healthy and it was fine. Yeah. Um, I'm the same with you. Boarding, I won't do. I used to do that with my lab 10 plus years ago. And after the horror stories, I decided not to. Same thing with doggy daycare. And somebody put on here, I just have to say that it's really scary to leave a veterinarian that you've trusted for years because they don't agree with titering or they don't understand it. And my res my response to that is in the guide, we do, or you can just look it up, but we do share the link to find um, other veterinarians that are more holistic or integrative. It's just ahvma.org, find a vet. But what I tell people when they come to me and say, oh, I don't agree with my vet. I tell them like, don't, you don't necessarily have to uh, ignore what your vet is saying, but you are okay. And you are allowed to get a second vet opinion. And there's a growing body of integrative and more holistic veterinarians that do online consults that can kind of give you guidance to kind of help with um, decisions that you make, et cetera. So I think it's okay. Like I have a conventional veterinarian, um, that I'll consult sometimes, but I also have holistic veterinarians. Like I have what I call a little care team for my animals, just mm -hmm. based on what each one has expert. I have one holistic veterinarian, extremely experienced, but he doesn't do surgery anymore. So I have a conventional veterinarian who will push, you know, all these vaccines and stuff. But if my dog, like my, my foster dog, Marlo, I know you have a Marlo. She's not, um, she's not spayed yet. And, you know, we're kind of talking about the different spay options, which our spay video, by the way, is all linked below. And, uh, but he doesn't do that. So I, for me, I have a care team for my animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the veterinarian that I use now for my dogs, she's not holistic. She will yep. do titers and she's very open to discussions. Like I walked in and said, you okay with me raw feeding my dog? She said, yeah, sure. Gave her a copy of my cookbook. She went, oh, cool. You know, it's all about being able to have a veterinarian that you can have a conversation with. Um, and that's talked a lot about in my new book, Raising Naturally Healthy Pets, like how to have those conversations with your veterinarian, yep. how to, um, you know, come to an understanding because we do have you know, just like we have uh, food deserts, we have veterinary deserts where you got one veterinary yeah. practice in a 50 mile radius and that's your choice. Yeah. So it's a matter of being able to have a conversation with them, bringing them things like the statements from the AHA and statements from AVMA and just saying, look, you know, br bringing them some of the studies uh, and saying, 
you know, I just choose to do this differently with my pet. I'm the pet parent. I'm responsible for my pet's health and well-being. I choose not to put chemicals into my pet. I choose to feed my pet human grade food, whatever, whatever it is that you are doing, mm -hmm. you are your pet's advocate and you need to just have a conversation without backing them into a corner and without, um, making them feel defensive and just saying, you know, let's see if we can come to a middle ground here. Like when a technician comes in a room and they go through the whole litany of your dog needs to be on heartworm preventative, your dog needs to be on flea and tick preventative, your dog is due for these 16 vaccines. I go, you did a really good job explaining that. I understand you're doing your job. Thank you so much. I'm going to decline. You know, just it, it just tell them that you understand, you appreciate. I do this with my human doctor. When I go in and he's like, oh, you need a tetanus, you need a whooping shot, you need a flu, you need, you know, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I don't, but thanks for the paperwork. And, you yeah. know, here, don't waste the paper. And they're like, no, we have to give it to you. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll throw it out on the way out. But, um, you know, it, but just being able to kind of joke around and have that conversation and say, yeah, I'm going to do it a little different. Yeah. They, in a book I read about like having difficult conversations, they always say that your initial response to someone that might have a controversial view to you is to agree with them. Even if it's something like, I agree, that's an important topic that said, <laughs> you know, or something. So exactly what you said, like, I hear everything you recommended. You're doing a great job. I know it's your job. So that's, that's really good. I have one last question. I know we're on time, but this is, I don't want you to deep dive it because if anybody wants to know more about this, we already have a full hour video I'll link down below, but because it's been asked and I think it's similar on the topic of putting chemicals in our body and you just mentioned it, can you give me what I'll call your elevator thought on heartworm and traditional flea and tick monthly preventatives for your pets? My dogs don't get any of them. There you go. Uh, <laughs> flea and tick for my guys, we use natural powders for the um, barn kitties because they have more exposure because they're catching mice and they're playing with rodents. Uh, my dogs, if we go somewhere where there's a lot of exposure, I will use essential oil sprays. I feed garlic if we're in flea season and I'm worried about exposure. Um, heartworm preventative, I keep mosquitoes away from my dogs. Uh, I do live in the South now. If you live up North, um, cold weather kind of stops the transmission of heartworms. Uh, at least in the winter months. So, uh, you know, it's really everything we talk about, whether it's what you're feeding, what you're using for parasite prevention, what you're uh, doing as far as exposure to other animals. It's an individual lifestyle for every single dog. There is no one size fits all. I have four dogs. They eat four different meals twice a day. They do not all eat the same thing. They have different supplements in their bowls. They have different exercise routines. They have um, different mental stimulation. Everyone is treated as an individual. Yeah. And same goes for me um, because I learn everything I know from you and veterinarians like you. I feel so, I, I just, I feel so honored um, to have this kind of access to you because like <laughs> you are a rare one of a kind. And like, that's why I love sharing you on my platform. So to end this, I just want to remind everybody that we collaborated and created on the screen, for, sorry, Instagram, you can't see it, but a guide on vaccinations. And this basically outlines how Dr. Judy and I approach vaccines with our personal pets. And it also gives a link to science and studies around this, as well as just more resources. So that's completely free linked in the description or linked in my bio. Um, and then more importantly, uh, Dr. Judy recently yeah. launched her new book. There you go. And then the longest chapter in this book is the vaccine chapter um, yeah. because it, it it's so important. And so every single vaccine is spelled out as far as how long it lasts, side effects that you might expect, how often your veterinarian is going to recommend it, what uh, dogs and cats, sh it's, this is dogs and cats, uh, should or should not get the vaccines, how to determine what might be necessary for your pet's lifestyle. Um, and there's also a big chapter on parasites and parasite prevention, because those are the questions that we get all the time. All the time. Yep. So that will be linked below or in my description or in my bio. And I want to challenge everybody watching this, that if you have a conventional veterinarian uh, that is of opposing views of what we talked about today, send this book to them either, you know, it's, it's a, it's an affordable book. Um, and 
I think by doing, I love doing that when I come across veterinarians that have opposing views, which happens quite a bit and putting myself on the internet. Um, it's a uh, very kind of in my face and I will find their clinic and I will ship them a book like this, or, um, I love, you know, sending something like this and I just send it with kind words anonymously. And I think it could be a great gift. And the impact it can have if maybe you send it to three veterinarians and one of them takes it and, and learns something from it, the impact it could have is tremendous. So I challenge you, if you're passionate about this, which I know you are because you're watching this, share this book with your vet. Um, that said, Dr. Judy, I appreciate you. We all appreciate you. Um, I hope we can do this again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Anytime we can educate, we are thrilled.